just pray that you would take joy today, that you would be blessed, that you would anoint these messages, soften our hearts to receive them and, and to truly hold on to them, to retain it and, and just take forth in the days that, that are ahead of us, Lord. But we thank you so much for bringing us here today. Thank you for the past and the future. And we pray this all, Lord, with a thankful heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Page number six in your hymnal. Oh, 
May the Lord receive glory today. You can go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 13. Starting in verse 1 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. You ever find yourself in that place in periods of testing and struggle where you do, you cry out, how long? How long will this go on? And where are you? Sometimes we find ourselves saying, you see, David say it in the Psalms over and over. And I'm thankful for the Psalms. I'm thankful for David's example because without that, you might think that you're the only one that's ever thought that. You might think that uh, you're wrong in, in feeling that way, but, but we're not. You know, the, the principle is clear in the word that sorrow will last for a night, but there will be a shout of joy that comes in the morning. And it's easy for us to say that we want to be with the Lord, that we love Him, and everyone wants eternity, everyone wants heaven. Jim Caviezel says, I believe that everyone wants the resurrection, but no one wants the cross. And the truth is, is that to get to glory, you must go through suffering. And Christ himself led the way in that. Like he set the example. You can turn to Romans chapter 8. If we're to share in his glory, it will come through suffering. There's not a question about that in the Word. If you just examine the New Testament alone, just look through it or examples of the forefathers in the Old Testament. Every time it works that way. And really, it's not something to be afraid of when, when you know it for what it is, when you see it rightly. It will be in chapter 8, verse 16. It says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. You know, we find that we are heirs with Christ if we suffer with him, and that we will be glorified with him because we suffer with him. And the word suffer there. Well, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word suffer? For me, it's physical pain or, or some sort of uh, difficulty in that respect, some sort of affliction. But if you look up suffering, and it does mean that, but in this example and in every example we'll look at today, the word suffering, it's uh, the Strong's uh, number 3958 and 3804, I'll spare you uh, the pronunciations. But it means the capacity and privilege of experiencing strong feeling or deep emotion as in agony or passion. And it also means that it's preparing us to know the Lord better now and forever in glory. It can include affliction, but it's affliction that results in knowing God's glory. And it's only negative outside the context of being in the Lord. That's the only time the word suffering should be negative in this sense because and I just thought it was interesting in looking at this and thinking about this last night that it's not just talking about physical pain though yeah we experience that Jesus experienced that for sure but much more than that it's talking about well it calls it a privilege to be a, be able to experience strong emotion and we find that our Lord led the way for us in experiencing that and it was fitting for him to do so. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll, we'll be in Hebrews in a moment. But first, we'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, as I was thinking on this, is there, we just find ourselves so many times in 
protracted periods of testing, and that is as it should be. It's a good thing, but it doesn't stop the feelings from coming, the, the feelings that you find David explaining in the Psalms where you say, how long, O Lord? And that's an okay thing. And, you know, I know that we know this, and we go over this often, but for me, I find the longer the protracted period goes on, you continually have to reset your focus. You continually have to be reminded of God's truth and, you know, what he says about it. And it's just a wonderful thing in that to have the friend that we have in Jesus. Because if you're like me, when you're going through something difficult, it makes it 10 times better as soon as you have a brother that comes alongside you, someone that is there to help you bear it, someone that's been through it before, just someone to be with you. It doesn't change the circumstances, but it changes your perspective and the way you feel about it immensely. And it's such a strength to me to think about how Jesus pioneered the way, like he went before us, and, and we'll read it in Hebrews. It's, you know, he experienced it so that he could be merciful and understanding and how he relates with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within, within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You know, so we find that because of the suffering, we're able to experience the Lord's comfort, and we experience the same suffering he did, and are comforted by the same comfort he was, and then by extension to people that we serve, to our brethren, it's, it's the same suffering through that and the same comfort that we're able to share through that. So there's so many good things that come from it, and it's so necessary. Go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. We'll start in verse 9. says, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. And I've always thought of that word author as like, you know, someone who writes something or he created our salvation, but really the, the Greek word there, it means someone who pioneered the way for others to follow. That's what it means that he authored our salvation, and he authored it through sufferings. So by definition, we are called to follow the pioneer of suffering. We're called to follow in his footsteps in that suffering. And again, this word suffering here isn't just some sort of physical turmoil, but it's emotional tur turmoil. It's deep feelings and, and passion. And, and isn't that the harder part? You know, it's, you would never take anything away from what Jesus suffered or what anybody that has a protracted illness or, you know, chronic pain or something of that nature. But isn't the harder, like the, the physical pain causes emotional pain. The physical pain when it grinds on and on, I mean, you can tough that out in, in the flesh. And, you know, we have medicines. And I mean, there are ways to deal with that and you can learn to get used to it. But what you don't really get used to in the same way is the emotional agony of, of that suffering or 
or other things that aren't physical that cause suffering. You know, we all have different trials that we go through or, or watching someone you love suffer. It's that emotional agony, I think, that afflicted Jesus far more. I'm sure it was, I would venture to say it was easier for him to deal with what happened on Calvary with the cross than it was the night before in the garden where he's just crying out. He wants to die. Like that lasts and lasts and lasts and that feeling where you're sick at your stomach. You know, that's, that's, that's what he went through for us and that's what he pioneered for us to follow in. But the good news is, is in us following in that, we have him alongside us. We have his experience and his mercy, his comfort. Verse 11 says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. I mean, doesn't that touch you that he's not ashamed of us, that he's pleased to call us his brethren and that you know, we're his father's children, and so he was eager and willing to come and share in the weakness that we share in so that he could become our high priest, uh, one that is merciful. Verse 16 says, For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Turning over to verse uh, chapter 4, I mean. Verse 14. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, so even though we will and we do find ourselves in places where we're calling out to him or crying out, he's always faithful. If we draw near to him, like he's there, he's near to us already. And then we will find grace that we need to help in time of need. And then over in chapter 5, verse 7, we find that Jesus in the days of his flesh offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. You know, that's kind of the main point today is that, yes, we, we know that suffering is a part of our calling. We know that it's necessary and that there's good on the other side. But we don't have to go through it alone. We have... We have Jesus who, who he went before us and, and lived 33 years where the whole time, you know, most of us think it's not that you never have plenty of people have had difficult childhoods, but as a child, you know, you're not really aware of these things. You're not, you're not uh, in the faith yet. And so you can kind of live some years in blissful ignorance to some degree before the rea rea reality of life can set in. But Jesus, you know, the whole 33 years. We know from, for sure from the time he was 12, he was aware of what he was doing. He, he was willing to live a life where he constantly had to offer prayers and supplications and loud cries. And so he understands what it is that we're going through when we cry out to him. And he's there. He's near to us. We'll uh, finish up in the Psalms, Psalm chapter 34.
David and I were talking about something on Thursday, and he was saying that despite how difficult and awful the circumstances may seem, if we knew what God knew at the end of it, if we could see the end of it, we wouldn't change it. We would pick the exact same thing. It's like, you know, I said when we, at the beginning, is that, you know, we want His glory. We want to be with Him. We want to be close to Him. And so if the price to get to that is suffering, if it's, you know, a few passing years of, of difficulty here, then it's well worth it. And, we, and we, we should be, well, it's like Paul says, it's not worthy to be compared. The glory that is to come is, is it doesn't even, shouldn't be in the same category of, of comparing against what, what we face now. And, and so we, when we see it rightly, when we continually set our mind on Jesus and then remind ourselves of, of the truth about the situation of the reality and kind of get past the way it feels in the flesh, then we would all choose, you know, what we've been called to. We, we choose what, what God has in store. We know that He is right. It's not a negative thing. Chapter 34 in Psalms will be verse 15. It says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers. He delivers them out of all their troubles, and the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And you know, for that alone, I think that it's worth it. Like, wouldn't you much rather be afflicted and be brokenhearted and have the Lord near to you than to have everything there is in the world to be as comfortable in the flesh as possible and have him far from you? You know, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and He's faithful to deliver us, and, and that makes it all worth it just to have him close. Hallelujah. Today is going to be more of a testimony than a sermonette, honestly. Um, Last night I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about, and uh, you know, last month um, when Hanukkah came around, we had a few of the boys over, and Liz wanted to get them a little something for the first night, so she came up with an idea where we had uh, little jars that she bought and little notepads and pens, and that throughout the year that they could write down good things that God had done, times that God had provided, and put that in the jar. And then at the end of the year, you know, next year, around Hanukkah, again, look at that. Because, you know, you, there are so many things that you forget. Um, and we started doing the same thing off and on. And I don't know if it was because we were paying closer attention or if it was just because God did more things during the last two months or so. But it seems like it's just been one thing after another where God has provided in big and small things just over and over. Um, one of those things that was kind of a big deal for us was, you know, as many of you know, my car was not drivable for probably about six weeks or so. And I, we thought it was something extremely major, something that basically would have totaled the car and made it not fixable, really. Um, I, when I first got it, I took it to the dealership, and they gave me a diagnosis that the transmission was going out, and it was it, he, the guy said it could be two weeks, it could be two years, but it's going to stop. So that's always kind of been in the back of my mind. So one day, I um, went to go pull out of the driveway, and it was running like a tractor. Just wouldn't really get up to speed, just shaking real bad. So I figured, like, well, th it's finally happened. Um, so I did a little research on it, but I was already kind of, I had already kind of concluded what it was, um, and of course it wasn't feasible for me to, to fix it given the, the quotes that I had and what I had read online for people who had the, the same issue with their car. So we, we were in a kind of a tight spot, um, and Brian and Jim were gracious enough to let me borrow their truck during that time while we tried to kind of figure out what we were going to do. Um, because, you know, Liz works full time and then some, and I work two different jobs and the, the schedules can be kind of all over the place with those two. Um, and then change, 
you know, from week to week, it's not really set. Um, so sharing a car wasn't really going to be something that we could do long term. Um, but long story short, um, two weeks ago uh, on a Saturday night, Jody and Sandy came over. It was freezing cold, um, and they helped me fix that car. Um, what I thought was a transmission issue um, turned out to be something that was fixed in probably less than three hours, I'd say, two or three hours. Um, and it cost me under $100. Um, and it's been running like a top since we did that, better than it ever has since I got it. So it was just what I thought was literally going to be a $5,500 thing to fix that just would not ever be feasible for me to do. Ended up being something like $89 or something like that. And, you know, I could, I could buy uh, Sandy and, and Jody a burger and probably still be under $100, which is just incredible, you know, that, that God provided in that way. Because it was, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's not a huge thing. And I was thinking about that uh, when Liz and I were kind of like, what are we going to do? And, I, and I, we were sitting in our climate-controlled house that we own and, and her car outside. And I was like, our second car, what? <laughs> this is awful. It's like, it it kind of makes you feel silly, but it's like, God, still, that still mattered to me. And we were praying about it. So, so God blessed us in that way. He chose to do that. Um, another thing, too, that actually happened, I think it was, it was Thursday morning, Thursday early afternoon maybe, you know, we had that crazy cold temperatures that came through last week down to like five or something like that. And so our pipes froze. And so we didn't, we didn't have any water for showers or anything since probably like Monday night or something, Tuesday morning. So we were stinking. Um, <laughs> Uh, all we had was cold water in, in the kitchen faucet. It was the only water in the house that we had. So we couldn't, we couldn't do any laundry, we couldn't shower, we couldn't do any dishes, so the house was getting to be a wreck and everything. Um, so I had work Thursday afternoon, so I wanted to leave uh, a faucet dripping to see if it would maybe relieve some of the pressure uh, in the pipes because it was supposed to warm up a little bit Thursday, at least above freezing, so I thought, well, while I'm gone, maybe it'll... Um, you know, thaw out and everything. Um, so when I went into the bathroom and turned the faucet on a little bit, I could hear rushing water. So I, I got down to the floor to listen, and under the house, of course, I could hear it just gushing out. So I went outside, looked under there, and sure enough, it's just pouring out. So I thought, well, the pipes are busted. So I, I called work and called in, and I'm thinking, I'm giving up a shift today, missing work, and then who knows what this is going to cost and the time it's going to take and how extensive all this is. So I hit the panic button on my phone and told Michael, I was like, what do I do? And so he, uh, he said, okay, I'll come over there in, in a few minutes. And so he came over and he crawled under there. Um, and uh, he had me go out and turn the, the water off and let it settle for a minute. Um, and what it turned out to be was a little elbow, elbow joint where two copper pipes came together. So it had come loose. So he cut the other side off, and we went to Lowe's, bought a $8.79 new elbow, and put it on there and turned the water on, and it was perfectly fine. So again, what I thought could be a big deal and was going to be a headache, it was just this tiny little thing, and it ended up costing, I think, like 16 bucks, and that was with buying Michael a burger from Wendy's. So I counted that in there. So it was a $16 fix, you know, so that was a, a huge you know, weight off of my chest, too, because I was, you know, thinking it was going to be a lot worse than it was. Um, and God just provided for us, and those, you know, both of those situations could have been a whole lot more serious, obviously, but, and, but even if it had been, uh, if, if God hadn't chosen to provide in that way, he would have provided in another way. If the pipes had been completely busted and it cost a bunch of money, or if, if, if that was something more serious with my car that made it just completely inoperable for now until forever, he would have provided a way still. Um, turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Begin in verse 25. <clears throat> Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not of more value, that, value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And of course the things Jesus is talking about there are, are much more basic than the issues that, that we were facing. Um, talking about the things that you need to survive, clothing and shelter and food. Um, and again, <laughs> I wrote here a note um, about how silly you can feel when you do, when you realize what it is that you're stressing about in relation to the things that other people are without. Um, you know, and obviously I needed a vehicle to continue working, uh, you know, those jobs to bring home whatever money I could to provide. But God, again, it's not me that's providing in the first place. God is providing, and he always will, no matter what happens in those situations. Um, turn over to, to chapter 7. Begin in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, your Father who is in heaven give, give good things to those who ask him? And that's just a, a promise that God will give us good things. Um, and that might not always look good. It might not always be what we ask for, but that's the promise that it will be for our good. So like I said, whatever had happened with our situations, even if it had looked worse, I always have to keep in mind that it would be for our good no matter what or for the good of his people. Um, turn to Genesis chapter 22. And this is a, a story, of course, that we all know well, but I'll, we'll go over a, a part of it here. We get in verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had, hold, had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the, on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out, of his, reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his, up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And, you know... The place where God provided a sacrifice in place of Isaac um, was very likely the same place where Jesus was offered up in our stead as the ultimate sacrifice, if not the exact spot, at least on the same range. Um, so God was foreshadowing that he was going to provide a sacrifice in our place. And, you know, God provides a way for his people um, even in the small things. Amen.
Psalm 119, verse 1 through 16. You're only truly happy when you walk in total integrity, walking in the light of God's word. What joy overwhelms everyone who keeps the ways of God, those who seek him as their heart's passion. They'll never do what's wrong, but will always choose the paths of the Lord. God has prescribed the right way to live, obeying his laws with all our hearts. How I long for my life to bring you glory as I follow each and every one of your holy precepts. Then I'll never be ashamed, for I take strength from all your commandments. I will give my thanks to you from a heart of love and truth, and every time I learn more of your righteous judgments, I will be faithful to all of your wor all your words reveal, so don't ever give up on me. How can a young man stay pure? Only by living in the word of God and walking in its truth. I have longed for you with the passion of my heart. Don't let me stray from your directions. I consider your prophecies to be my greatest treasures, and I memorize them and write them on my heart. To keep me from committing sins, treason against you. My wonderful God, you are to be praised above all. Teach me the power of your decrees. I speak continually of your laws as I recite out loud your counsel to me. I find more joy in, the fo in following what you tell me to do than in chasing after the wealth of the world. I set my heart on your precepts and pay close attention to all your ways. My delight is found in all your laws, and I won't forget to walk in your words.
Page number 46, which will be followed by page 44.
Bible Collective song, page number 10.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome all of you who are watching today. Uh, we do have special music today. Shane is going to sing Last Words. Sarah is going to sing Mighty to Save. If you have any prayer requests you'd like us to burn with our incense, write it down, put it in this bowl, or hold it up, and we'll come and get it. Well, tomorrow is the annual Right to Life March in Little Rock, which many of us will be attending. Um, we will meet here about noon tomorrow, uh, try to leave maybe by quarter past 12, make our way down to Little Rock, be praying for the weather, and I just mean God's will in the weather. As you know, one of our most successful marches was in the cold, driving rain. And I still remember the images uh, on the local news of our guys carrying that 20-foot banner in the driving rain uh, all the way up uh, marching to the state capitol. That was just a, a wonderful thing. It made such an impact because it, it showed that we were serious. We weren't like fair weather Christians or fair weather marchers, but that we came out and uh, I might add, you know, that the, the attendance was down that year, but there were still a lot of people out there. And we do have a chance of rain uh, tomorrow, but uh, they've reduced it some. Uh, I'm not going to say that's bad news because it could be good news like it was that year, but uh, but the temperatures are supposed to be in the uh, mid-60s, so we're having uh, some unusually warm weather uh, that's forecast for tomorrow. So from my perspective, that's a plus. Amen. Um, remember to uh, continue praying for Gerard uh, Retzer, uh, Jody's sister's husband who I guess you probably noticed on the church page that uh, they rescheduled his surgery for Wednesday. I think it was originally scheduled for Monday. And uh, pray for a miracle. Amen. Does anyone here need anointing today? Okay. Because everybody that needs anointing is not here. But we're praying for them. Amen. Uh, last night uh, during, during a is there any more prayer requests coming? Okay, you can sit. It should be. Last night during uh, our praise and prayer service, uh, early on I could feel the presence of the Lord. And uh, he impressed upon me. It's not that I didn't know it. But he had never impressed it upon me personally. But he impressed it upon me last night that he is emotional toward us. And then he brought to my mind, as I mentioned last night, but I'll mention for those who were not here last night and those who are watching, he brought to my mind uh, the day that... Uh, God moved me to bless my oldest son, Michael. We were, we were in his room, and we were uh, on our knees on the floor. And God was, through me, was speaking over him. I'm, I remember very little. Uh, but uh, it was very powerful. The Spirit of God was so heavy there. It was glorious indeed. And uh, I felt uh, a tear that hit my forearm here. And uh, it was real. I mean, it wasn't like I just felt it. I could see it. <laughs> I could feel it with my other hand. And I, I knew it was uh, from the Lord. And he brought that to my mind last night uh, just as an illustration to confirm what he had said that he is emotional toward us. Now, that may not be uh, 
so much of a news to some of you, but for the people of our background, we were taught against any kind of a show of emotion. Uh, you know, we were told that, you know, you can't be controlled by emotion, and that's true. We don't want to be controlled by emotion. Uh, but to suppress emotions that are real, that are from God, that's also wrong. I mean, think about it. <laughs> Hello, wife. How are you this morning? <laughs> you know, did you have a good night's sleep? I mean, that's, that's kind of the way we were toward God. I mean, it was kind of like we're going to you know, meet God for the first time. Hello, I heard a lot about you. <laughs> I read about you in your word. And it's very pleased to meet you. I hope we have a good relationship from here on out. I mean... Uh, that's kind of how we were. I mean, I guess that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you know me. Um, so anyway, I thought uh, occasionally we should have a testimony. I was happy. I was thinking that, you know, then Matthew gave two testimonies, uh, and, and that's, that's good, you know. Sometimes uh, if some of you uh, speakers uh, that do the sermonettes, if if you don't happen to have uh, anything, uh, God move you to prepare something, maybe you give a, a testimony and, and then just tie a scripture or two in like Matthew did. I think that's good. Um, but I want Trion to come up here uh, in a moment because uh, it's interesting because uh, the, the, uh, the same thing happened to her. And uh, so I thought we'd just have a short testimony on that before we go any farther here. Speaking of emotional, you got the most emotional person up here <laughs> today, I think. Um, years ago, I wrote it down in my, my Bible. I forgot which Bible, though. Um, years ago, um, Sarah was... Sarah was singing special music, <clears throat> and it's a, one of my favorite ones. I think it's Sing to Jesus, but there's two Sing to Jesus, right? It's not Hallelujah, Sing to Jesus. What's the name of it? Sing to Jesus, yeah. Thank you, dear. Anyway, <clears throat> I was sitting up here <clears throat> in our spot, and she was singing that, and I was just deep in worship. I was so emotional. I was just, I felt filled with the Spirit. And I was just worshiping to that song. Because some of the lyrics, especially the lyric that says, um, he talks about our Lord being nailed to a tree. And then it says, um, bowing his sacred head. <laughs> And it's thinking about God bowing his head in anguish. It was just too much. So I was sitting right there, and uh, I had my head down like this, and my hands were in my lap like this, and I felt a tear fall from heaven. And I felt it, and I looked at it, and I felt of it, and then I looked up, and I looked around, and I said, Oh, that was from God right there. It wasn't from the air conditioning. It wasn't from my tears because my hands were too far out. But it was the Lord's tear. And I know he was moved that we were worshiping to that song and acknowledging the anguish that he went through for us, that he was emotional for us, that we're emotional back to him. I just have remembered that from now on. It's one of my favorite experiences that I, that I draw on. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, John, would you come up and pray over these prayer requests, and then uh, afterwards we'll have special music. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and as represented in heaven, we bring our prayers before you secretly, that you know exactly how to meet each need and better to our understanding and we know that every blessing comes with a burden and every burden comes with a blessing. 
So we just ask that your Holy Spirit move over these prayer requests, Lord, and those that are not here that may have had requests to put in this bowl. We ask that your divine power speak forth your will to be done in each and every instance, even more so than we can even think of. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, be anointed myself. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and your Son, our blessed Pastor, has come before you as you've commanded him to come before the elders and to be anointed. Lord, and we ask that your Holy Spirit just empower his body and his mind and his spirit. You know what is amiss. You know what the attack is. You know what the burden is. And we know that it's a pleasure to accompany Jesus in his sufferings. It's a we're pleased to do so for he did so much for us, but we also know it's for a limited amount of time. We ask that your blessings be upon him. Just pour through, just radiate through his body and his mind and his spirit. Let him be unhindered and unburdened as your minister to the congregation and to those that may be watching. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Hallelujah. <clears throat> While the Bible teaches us how to become a Christian and how to live this faith of truth faithfully to God and obediently before him, the Bible also warns us of nominal Christians who are worldly and of false brethren who may be deceived, believing false doctrines, straying from the apostolic faith, and even wolves. Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 24, we'll, we'll read that. And we are warned in the words of of uh, the the Bible from beginning really to till the end to not be deceived to worship God in spirit and in truth. We want to talk about some of the characteristics of being a true and faithful Christian. What is a true and faithful Christian? Because there are many who are Christian in name only. Amen. So. Who is a faithful and true Christian? Now, uh, I would say, of course, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. Amen? I mean, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8 says you don't belong to God. So, you know, if we have the Holy Spirit and we're led by the Holy Spirit, we're obeying the Holy Spirit, then we are a true and faithful Christian. I want us to turn over to Matthew chapter 24. But the characteristics of false Christians are that they may be worldly. That's a nominal Christian, a person who is a Christian in name only. But you can't really distinguish them from other people in the world. Amen. They're not lights in the world. They blend right in with the darkness that is in the world. Amen. So that's one of the characteristics of a nominal Christian. And, you know, um, a nominal Christian generally has not really had an experience with God. He hasn't really been convicted by the Holy Spirit, you know. Or maybe he was convicted by the Holy Spirit, but he wasn't taught. You know, when Jesus sent his uh, apostles out, he said in Matthew chapter 28, you go to all the world and you preach this gospel. And then those who receive this gospel, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then you teach them all that I taught you. So being a Christian is more than just being saved. Being a Christian is also knowing that we have a Savior and we have a Lord. And Jesus asked the question, how is it? Why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? You see, as Christians, we follow Jesus Christ, the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to understand one thing that false teachers uh, commonly uh, will say. Well, Jesus didn't teach that. You can't find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus actually said that or taught that very thing. Listen, if everything that Jesus taught were in the Gospels, we wouldn't have a book that we could carry around. Amen. And John said that. John said, if it, there's a lot more, but if it, we, you, we, we can write everything down. That's what he said. How do we know what the, the, the faith of Jesus Christ is? It's by the teachings of those whom he sent forth. It's his apostles. So we look at the teachings of Jesus, but we understand that they are magnified and are interpreted and understood correctly by the teachings of the apostles, amen? So we have the letters of the apostles and, and they are teaching us uh, specifically what to do and how to be. And we, have to, we are to put our faith in Christ Jesus alone for salvation, alone for our righteousness, but that he has called us also to walk in good works prepared beforehand. So we have to walk obedient, obediently before the Lord as well. And we know that the Bible says that the wrath of God rests upon the children of disobedience. So we don't want to be legalistic. We don't want to have the idea uh, that 
uh, you know, that we can save ourselves and the, any works of the law can save us. Any of the works of the law can produce a righteousness in us. On the other hand, we don't want to ignore God's commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to the Gentile congregations, he said, what matters is keeping the commandments of God. And we see the last writings of the Bible, all about keeping the commandments of God and walking in the truth, 1 John and 2 John and in the book of Revelation. So we don't want to go in either ditch. We don't want to go in the ditch of legalism and we don't want to go into lawlessness either, you know, to where nothing matters and that we don't have to obey God. We understand fully that we're always going to come short. But in Christ Jesus, we're never short. Amen. We're always uh, faithful. And we don't want to go into idolatry or false, a false type of Christianity, a false religion based upon idolatry, which also infiltrated the early church. Now, uh, here in Matthew chapter 24, we're going to see some of the warnings that Jesus gave us uh, to prepare us for this end time in which we are living in. And we are living in the last days. I believe that. And there's, I don't believe it just because I look around and I see that the world is bad. But I look uh, over the this, this sea and, and I see a United States of Europe. I see a European Commonwealth. And I see that the scriptures foretell uh, four beasts that would arise out of the earth. The first being represented by Babylon. The second, the Medo-Persian Empire. The third, the Empire of Greece under Alexander the Great. And the fourth was Rome. But the fourth would be revived. The fatal head wound would be healed and the fourth beast would be revived. So there is no fifth beast. You know, there's a fourth beast that was and shall be. And that was clearly Rome. It was there during the time of the apostles. And uh, Rome represents a, a, a united Europe, and that's what we have. And, and so that's what we have today. And of course, we've been preaching this for a long time. I mean, as long as I can remember, 40 years. And uh, so we've known, even when there was no European Commonwealth, when the Soviet Union had, uh, you know, uh, taken over many of the Eastern European countries. And there was a wall down uh, the center of the city of Berlin in Germany. Uh, and people would say, how could it possibly be that there would be a united Europe and Germany would head that and that would be the end time beast? It must be Russia, it must be China, it must be an Islamic uprising, a caliphate or something. Well, the Bible says that there were four beasts that came out of the sea in, in Daniel chapter 7. We see that clearly. Not five, four. And the fourth would be destroyed, but would be resurrected and come to power again. And that's what we see. So it's not going to be. It's not going to be something else. It's going to be that. And there's going to be a man, and he's likely alive right now. The false prophet is likely arrive, alive right now. And uh, the Antichrist is, is, is going to be the leader of that European uh, commonwealth. And he eventually will take his seat in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, and he will claim to be God. The false prophet will call fire down from heaven, probably to kindle the fire on the altar, uh, because you can't kindle your own fire. You know, the, when the temple was was built, even with the tabernacle, God brought the fire down and the priests were to keep that fire going. So think about that. That would deceive the entire world. And this man would come on the scene and say, well, Jesus was a good man. He was a prophet, but he was not the Messiah. I am. I am God. I am Messiah. And he'll do great signs and wonders. And he will speak like no one has ever spoken since Jesus, but the people on this earth will have not heard Jesus. It will be easily deceived. And so uh, that's something that is going to happen. And uh, so we are living in these last days. And that's what Jesus is, is his disciples. He's talking to his disciples about that here. His disciples wanted to know. Verse 1 of chapter 24. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away. When his disciples came up, to point out the temple buildings to him, how wonderful they were, how majestic these, 
these temple buildings were. And this wasn't Solomon's temple. This was Herod's temple. Uh, paled in comparison to the glorious temple that God had Solomon build. But let us understand something that it doesn't matter how great our temple is. It doesn't matter, you know, if, if we build a temple to honor God, we put God's name on it, and we go there and we give sacrifices to it, and uh, we give offerings to it and all kinds of things like that, and we stand there with our hands up and we praise God and we sing praises to Him. There at a beautiful temple, we sacrifice to build it and all that kind of stuff if we do not worship in truth. If we don't worship in spirit of truth, if we do not obey God, that doesn't matter. Amen? I mean, when the children of Israel began to go astray, what did God say? You better repent. He said, prophet after prophet, repent now. You better repent. If you don't repent and turn back to me and obey me, how do you repent? You turn away from doing what you're doing that is wrong, and you turn the other way and start practicing what is right, what is true. You turn from the false to the true. Amen? You turn from disobedience to obedience. That's simple. You turn from, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling your own uh, desires for self into say your will be done. That's what we do. So it doesn't matter. People can be praising God. You know, David built an ark to carry a new ark, probably a glorious ark to build the ark, to carry the ark of the covenant to Jerusalem. What he wanted to do, he wanted to bring God's presence to Jerusalem. He loved God. He was a man after God's own heart. And he built a beautiful new ark to carry that, that uh, a cart to carry that ark on. And God was angry. He was praising God. He was dancing. He was singing songs to God. And they, the music was sounding. And they were rejoicing as they're bringing God's presence to Jerusalem. Did God want his presence in Jerusalem? Of course. Did God want David to, to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem? Yes. Did it touch God's heart that David wanted to do that? Of course it did. But the method was wrong. The way he did it was wrong. Oh, his heart was right. His desire is right. What he wanted to do, the, 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 uh, you know, what his objective was right. But the way he carried it out was wrong. Now think about that. He's praising to God. And you know, God didn't come down to that. God did not send a prophet to David and say, hey, how long do you think it took that ark to be built? Do you think it escaped God's attention when, I mean, David thinks, you know what? Lord, I'm going to bring your presence I'm going to bring the ark of your presence, the ark of the covenant, to Jerusalem. And I'm going to build a house for you. I want to build a house for that. I want to build a the magnificent temple for you to, so that you'll be here with us. Your presence will be here. But that pleased God. He was a man after God's own heart. That pleased him. And then one day in, in finalizing the plans for it, he gives an order. Hey, build a new cart. And this is how I want it built. I want it built beautiful because we're going to put God's presence on it and we're going to roll it. He's going to be pulled right in by two oxen into the city and we're going to rejoice and we're going to sing praises for our God. Open up the gates. Open up those gates and let the king of glory come in. That's what they were, that's what David was thinking. God is looking down and he's thinking, now why? Is David doing this? David has my instructions in the pocket of his robe. I have commanded every king of Israel to read my instructions every day. If he wants to know how I want my presence to be carried, pull out that the book, pull, pull out the, the first five books of the Bible and give, let me instruct you on the shoulders of my holy priests. That's how I shall be carried. Now, where did the, you know, the ark was carried on the cart once before. You know who put it on the cart? Philistines. Well, they captured the ark because of the sins of Israel. And then plagues started breaking out among them because they had the ark and they opened the ark. And, and so they wanted rid of it before they all died. They put it on the cart and they just sent it back toward Israel. That was a pagan way to carry God's presence. That's the way that they did it. God didn't want it done that way. And all the rejoicing is going on. And God caused that cart being pulled by those oxen to hit a hole. And when, the, when it did, the cart kind of tilted over and the Ark of the Covenant began 
to fall and Uzzah walking beside that, watching David rejoice, all the musicians pray, uh, uh, sing, uh, playing their instruments gloriously, reached up to keep the ark from falling and God struck him dead. And, God, and David was angry and David was frightened. And we know the story. And David didn't know what to think. They just left the ark there. And he went back and he didn't know what to do. So he looked in the Word. Lord, how do you want it done? And he saw and he called the priest, Zadok in, the priest, and he said, the reason why there was, listen to me, reason why there was an outburst against us is because we didn't follow the method that God said. We didn't follow the way he said he wanted the ark transported. It wasn't that he didn't want the ark to come. He didn't want it to be carried on a cart, even a new cart, even a gloriously special made cart for this special occasion. He didn't want it. That teaches us something. We can think up ways of how we want to honor God. Maybe God doesn't want to be honored that way. Maybe you think, well, we'll set this day aside for God. I know. How about Sunday? I know. How about December 25th for God's birthday? You better think about it. You better think about it. Because if God did not accept David praising God, a man after God's own heart, if he would not allow David to bring his presence, to put his presence on a new, specially made cart to bring it into Jerusalem where he could build a new house for the Lord, don't think he's going to just accept any way we decide. The truth of the matter is, that thought did not come from David. Satan whispered that thought into his mind because Satan knows well that God would not receive that. Now, God doesn't receive it. We find in Deuteronomy chapter 12, God told the children of Israel, when you go into the land to possess the land, don't learn the way the nations worship their gods. And don't use the same customs that they worship their gods with in worshiping me, for it is an abomination to me. People want to know why we do what we do? You want to know why we don't do what we do? Right here. There's no tradition except apostolic tradition. It's just the Word of God. And if you can't defend it, and there's a lot of things you can't defend, can't defend a, a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection because it didn't happen. Because Jesus said, I'll be in the grave three days and three nights. That's the only sign that I will give you that I am the Messiah. If I'm not in the grave three days and three nights, I'm not Messiah. Muslims to this day say Jesus is not Messiah because he wasn't in the grave three days and three nights. He was telling you he wasn't Messiah when he said that. Because he, he's saying the real Messiah will be in the grave three days and three nights. Muslims to this day, they believe Jesus and accept him as a teacher and as a prophet, but not as any kind of Messiah. I've had discussions with them about it. They have some of our writings on their forums. Because we understand that Jesus said as Jonah was in the Great fish, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the grave, three days and three nights. And we went in the grave at the end of Wednesday in 31 AD and 30 AD, whichever, both of those dates, possible dates that he was crucified, have a Wednesday Passover. And we know he's crucified on the Passover. And that's a truth. And we need to know that. And so Mary Magdalene came to the tomb when? Early Sunday morning, while it was dark. Not daylight, not sunrise. It was dark, and what did she find? The tomb was already empty. What'd she come to the tomb for? She came to the tomb in order to prepare his body with spices. Why? Because the day after the Passover, at sundown at Passover, is the first day of unleavened bread, which is a holy day. And the Bible says that after they put his body at the end of the Passover in the tomb, then they kept the Sabbath according to the custom. 
And that custom was a high day. It wasn't the weekly Sabbath. It was the first day of unleavened bread, the day after uh, the Passover, which can fall on any day of the week. So at, 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 at sundown Thursday is one day, at sundown Friday is two days, sundown Saturday is three days and three nights. He was resurrected at the end of the Sabbath. Mary Magdalene came uh, on the first day. While it was still dark, he was already gone. Now, if he was resurrected that morning, that's three days and four nights. He's not Messiah. But he is Messiah. He was resurrected the evening before, and she discovered the tomb empty. Amen? So we have to be able to defend the truth. Amen? John chapter 4 says that Jesus said that the Father is looking for true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. God, He said God must be worshipped in spirit and truth. And every time the devil plants a lie, it's not for no reason. He, You know, uh, if you think of a lie, a lie... Uh, I call the I call lies the devil's babies. They don't stay a baby; they grow. They grow, and and when you take one lie, let's say you take a a Friday cru- a crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection, which nobody can f- defend. Nobody tries to defend it. When you take that, then you you, you it's it's first it's not true. Jesus was crucified on, you know, the reason they'll say that is because the Friday is a day of preparation, and it says it was a day of preparation. Well, so is Passover. Passover is always an annual day of preparation. Passover is not a holy day, but the next day is, a high Sabbath. So the Passover is always a day of preparation for the high Sabbath. So that day of preparation, and John says it for that Sabbath was a high day, meaning an annual Sabbath. It was the 15th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar. It was the first day of unleavened bread. And when you have a lie, the devil sits it there. And if you don't get that up, he brings another lie and he builds upon it. And another one builds upon it. Pretty soon you have a whole structure. You have just a, a stronghold, a fortress here, that the foundation itself began with a lie. Now what Jude tells us, the brother of Jesus and his letter, general letter to the churches. He said, listen, brethren, I I wanted to write to you a letter rejoicing in our common salvation. How wonderful it is that we're all saved by the grace of God. That God has had mercy upon us. He gave his only son to wash away our sins and that he has given us a covenant of grace through faith by which he remembers our sin no more and we receive and maintain the righteousness of God, not by anything we've done, but by what he has done. That's wonderful and that's what Jude wanted to write about. He he wanted to write about that. And he started his letter, he said, brethren, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, but I was compelled by the Spirit of God to write to you, to tell you to earnestly contend for the faith, notice, once and delivered to the saints by the apostles. You know what the point of the whole Protestant Reformation was? Is to return to the apostolic faith. But who did? Who returned to the apostolic faith? What was the apostolic faith? Uh, you can read through the New Testament. You can read through Acts. And you can see that the early church had their faith in Jesus. The early church did not, the true Christians did not Judaize. They did not go back to the whole law of Moses. But they weren't lawless. They kept the commandments of God. You see that they kept the food laws. I mean, my, in the book of Acts, Peter himself, after being taught by Jesus for three and a half years, said, I, Lord, I'm not eating that common, those unclean animals. I, I've never defiled my body by eating anything unclean or common. By the way, a co- common animal is, is an animal that is come in contact with an unclean animal. Maybe getting drinking water from the same trough or something like that. Maybe you have a calf 
and it's drinking from a trough that a hog is drinking from, well, that's a com- it's not an unclean animal, but it's a common animal. And so it could contract some of the same uh, you know, uncleanliness or, or diseases that the unclean, unclean animal has. So Israel was instructed under the Mosaic law to not even eat a common animal. That means a clean animal that's been in contact with an unclean animal. But Peter said, I've never defiled my body. by he said, Lord, he knew it was Jesus, but he knew that's not what Jesus was talking about. And he denied three times. He said, no, I'm not going to eat this stuff. And then as he is contemplating what the vision might mean, the scripture there says in Acts, a knock came at the door and it was people from Cornelius' house, the first Gentile converts. And so Peter said at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, God has shown me that what he has cleansed, what he has accepted and cleansed, let no man call common, see, or unclean. So obviously that's what it's about. The early church kept the commandments of God, but they weren't legalistic. They didn't go back to the, all the uh, you know, 613 laws that were added because of transgressions. You see that clearly in, in Galatians chapter 3. But they were also not lawless. Paul said, the same apostle that said, you know, if you go back to all those laws, you've been severed from Christ. That same apostle said that what matters is keeping the, the commandments of God. So you can keep commandments of God without going back to the whole law of Moses. Amen? Obviously. And it's a matter of what's in the covenant. And our covenant is the same covenant as Abraham's covenant. The covenant of promise that's realized by the ratification of the blood of Jesus. And the early church kept the fourth commandment too. They kept the Sabbath. We see that clearly. The early church kept the holy days. You see that plainly in the book of Acts. And you think about, you know, uh, Paul said in Acts chapter 18, I I must by all means, this is in the King James Version, they use different manuscripts in in, in the King James than they do in the New American Standard because the New American Standard, some of the newer uh, translations um, have older manuscripts. And of course, if you're going to try to be more reliable, you'd use the ones closest to the originals. And those weren't available in 1611 when the King James people... uh, Uh, did the translation. So there's a little difference in the two. It doesn't change really anything. But in the King James Version in chapter 18, Paul says, I must by all means go to Jerusalem for the feast. And then in chapter 20, he said, we sailed, uh, you know, past Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Then later on, he talks about atonement. He calls it the fast. He is marking his journey his journeys by the holy days. He told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16, well, I, I'm going to come to you after Pentecost. Well, then was he talking to Gentiles? You, listen, if you, you and I keep the holy days, and we've kept them for a long time, but think about this. If you go to just someone common out here in the world and you say to them, well, listen, I'll get back to you after the Feast of Tabernacles. They won't know what in the world you're talking about. Most of them won't know what you're doing. What? Feast of Tabernacles? What are you talking about? Feast of what? Or if you say the Day of Atonement, they don't know what you're talking about. If you say the Days of Unleavened Bread, they don't know what you're talking about, even though they picture the God's great plan of salvation and they're wonderful. They don't know. But the early church clearly kept the commandments of God, but they still had their faith and their righteousness in Christ Jesus. And they kept the Sabbath, obviously, and uh, they kept the holy days as well, and the clean and and unclean meats. So that's characteristics of it. Now, okay, now let's read here Jesus uh, speaking about the end time. In verse 1, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be tore down. And that actually happened. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, well, tell us, when will all these things happen? Notice, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So he's wanting to know what's going to happen. What can we look for 
uh, knowing, to, to see that the time of your coming and the end of the age is at hand. And Jesus answered and said, notice the very first thing he said. See to it that no one misleads you. For many, is it few or many? Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Now, I don't take this to mean, and I don't think Jesus meant it this way, that people would be coming, I'm Jesus, I am Jesus Christ. I don't think that's what he's saying. People, many would come, because here's the fulfillment of it. How has it been fulfilled? Have we seen many? There's been a few that's come and said, I'm Messiah. But have we seen many in these last days come and say, I am the Messiah? No. I can't think of anybody. There was one Mexican or some South American uh, uh, preacher that says that he is Jesus. He's the Messiah. But, I mean, there's not many, right? Well, what is the fulfillment of it? How did, has this, how have we seen this prophecy of Jesus fulfilled? Well, if we take it this way, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. They're not saying they themselves are the Christ, but they are saying that Jesus is the Christ. So it said, many have come saying that Jesus is the Christ, but they mislead many. Now, how would you do that? Jesus is the Christ, and this is what he taught, except that's not what he taught. False teachers, amen? Now, verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Well, they're going to come in the name of Jesus. They're going to say, Jesus is Messiah. I'm teaching you what Christianity really is. And notice verse 12. This is interesting. Because lawlessness is increased, most people love. Most people's love will grow cold. Now, look at that. So where, where there is lawlessness, you have the opposite of love. Love grows cold. And how, do, how, do we, how do we fit that in the Scripture? Well, the Bible says that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John says, this is love, that you keep my, or God's commandments, and they are not a burden to you. This is how you know you love the children of God, that you keep the commandments of God. So when people stop keeping the commandments of God, then their love grows cold. Now, what authority does anyone have? Almost all faiths, all, almost all Christian denominations will tell you they believe in the Ten Commandments. The Catholics believe in the Ten Commandments so much that when they removed the second commandment, they felt like they needed to add one so there'd still be ten. Even though they teach that they have the authority to change whatever they want. You see, they believe that God has given that authority. But think about that. When they took out the second commandment out of the, their scriptures that, to, to, that forbids having graven images... They split the ninth, the tenth commandment into, they dropped it to nine, you shall not covet, but they split it into two. So you have two thou shalt not covet in, in verse nine and in verse 10. Don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, don't covet your neighbor's wife. So even they understood, even changing the Ten Commandments, they knew they needed to keep ten of them. Amen. The fourth commandment is the Sabbath. And we'll see here, even in this prophecy, that Jesus will tell us the Sabbath is still a holy day. Now, some people will try to spiritualize the Sabbath away. We'll say that's just the rest in Jesus. That's just a picture. That's just a shadow. Well, it is a shadow. Of course, it's a shadow. But some people use a shadow to kind of teach that, that it's not necessary. Well, that's silly. The Passover lamb was a shadow too. It was a shadow of Christ, amen? Passover of the true Passover lamb. The lamb that Abraham found stuck in the bush when he was about to offer his son Isaac. Well, that was a shadow, a shadow of Jesus Christ. Even Isaac was a shadow of Christ, amen? But he was still real. It's not that it, it doesn't change the actual 
Just because there's a spiritual application that we have a rest in Christ does not change the fact that we actually have a rest in a day. You see, the Sabbath is a day. To keep the Sabbath holy is a day. Now think about this. If you just uh, spiritualize it away, say, well, uh, we just rest in Jesus. How is it that you keep that holy? Think about that. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And God tells us why. For in six days, the Lord, your God, made heaven and earth and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Now, he didn't rest in Jesus. He didn't rest in some big spiritual rest. He rested on the seventh day of creation. It's an actual day. And he says, we are to keep the same day that he rested on. And the reason we're told to do it is not because, well, you need a rest, therefore just take one day and seven. It doesn't say that. It says, this is why you do it, because the Lord your God created all things in heaven and earth and everything that is in them in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. Why do we keep it? Because he kept it on the seventh day. And we find in Hebrews chapter 4, when we enter into this, today we enter into this rest, it says that we enter into the Lord's rest. Now, that scripture in Hebrews uh, 4 is talking about a greater rest. It's also talking about, uh, you know, the promise to come, the kingdom to come, paradise. It's, It's talking about our reward, our heavenly country the new Jerusalem. It's talking about all of those things that God has promised us. But it's using the weekly Sabbath as a actual example. He's saying, as you are diligent to enter into the weekly rest, Sabbatismos, so too be diligent to enter into that rest. That's all he's saying. I can say to you, just as you are careful to be time, to be on time at work, why don't you be equally as t- careful to be on time for services or be on time for uh, school? It's just an example. And that's what he's saying there. And a lot of people just focus on the one and they forget the, actual, the example he used as an actual commandment and the fulfillment of an actual commandment. So now we'll even see it here. Now, uh, let's see, uh, verse 13. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. So we have to endure. There's lots of things. Many are afflictions of the righteous. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the hills. So now we see where is the abomination going to be? In Judea. Why? Because those in Judea must flee when they see it. So they're going to see it where? In Judea. Where is the temple going to be rebuilt? In Judea. The, the abomination of desolation is an image of the beast. We see, read about it in Revelation chapter 13 that, that the, 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 the devil will even give the beast, the image, the power to speak. I believe it's an actual image, but whatever it happens to be, whether it's a hologram or whatever it happens to be, we're going to know if we're faithful. Amen? We're going to know. So we don't have to, it's okay to speculate, but we don't have to know because we're going to know when it happens. Because this abomination, this, this has happened before during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, you know, the king of the north, uh, about 200 years, 180 years or so before Jesus was born, uh, when the king of the north, Antiochus Epiphanes, brought his army through Israel uh, to fight the Ptolemies in Egypt. These were descendants of Alexander the Great's uh, uh, generals. You know, he, his, his kingdom was divided among his four generals. One had the king of the north, the, the uh, Seleucids, Antiochus, and then the, the, the south was the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies were generally um, not warlike, but the, the north was warlike, and they were at war. And when they came through, uh, 
Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV had taken the name Epiphanes upon himself, which means God in the flesh in Greek. I am Antiochus, God in the flesh. And he came into the temple there in Jerusalem when he was going back and forth fighting the Ptolemies in Egypt. And he was the one that that erected a statue of Zeus, which really he considered himself the embodiment of Zeus. So it was a statue of him, an image of him. And he sacrificed a hog on the altar. So it defiled the temple. And that's what Hanukkah is all about, by the way, is, a, is the rededication of the temple after that happened. So anyway, it's happened once. So we can kind of see that God has already given us a preview of kind of like what it may happen to be in the future. So I think it probably will be like that. I mean, think about it. The Passover lamb, Jesus, same thing. Isaac on Mount Moriah, Calvary, you know, to be offered and the lamb, ram was given instead. We have Jesus there, God provided at Calvary, Mount Moriah, the Mount, Moriah mountain range. God does everything on time, exactly on time. Jesus was crucified on the Passover. That's very unusual. They normally didn't do that. But he was crucified on the Passover. Why? Because he's the Passover lamb. So God does things exactly on time. He gave the Ten Commandments to Israel at Mount Sinai on the day of Pentecost, you see. So I believe this abomination of desolation, that's probably, it'll be an image of the beast, whatever it happens to be. Now notice, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now we're not talking about Jews, except Jews who are Christians. We're not talking about non-Christians. Why? Because they don't read the book of Matthew. <laughs> They're not going to heed this warning. They don't listen to Jesus. Anymore. If they did read it, they wouldn't pay attention to it. So Jesus is speaking he, to his followers. This is yet future. Amen? It's future, right? Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. And whoever is on the field must not turn back to get his cloak. In other words, he says it's going to happen fast. And then he says, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Man, it'd be awful if you're there and you've got to flee to the mountains from the face of the Antichrist, the image of the beast, and the, you know, it's going to be there. And not only that, the image of the beast is going to, according to Revelation chapter 13, is going to be able to identify true, who, the, who the true Christians are when we're persecuted, see. But now notice what Jesus said. In verse 20, and I don't know how people, you know, miss this, or they, there's no way to get around this. Jesus is talking in the future. This is 2,000 years ago Jesus said this. But what he's prophesying about has not happened yet. There is no abomination of desolation yet. There is no temple yet, even though there are plans to build it. But pray that your flight, flight, a flight from what? From Antichrist, from the abomination of desolation. Will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. If the Sabbath, if it didn't matter, if, this, if, if the Sabbath day, what, an actual day didn't matter, Jesus would not have said this, would he? But he said it. Now, how many Christians do you think are praying that their flight would not be on the Sabbath? Well, only those who keep the Sabbath. Amen. I mean, people that don't keep it, they don't have any reason to pray for that. It doesn't matter to them because they, they say every day is the same. Well, God never says that. God never says every day is the same. But people say that. And they'll say things like, they'll pull up a straw man. Well, you can worship God any day. Of course. Yeah, but you can only obey the Sabbath one day a week. <laughs> yeah, you can worship God any day and you should. But that doesn't mean that you don't keep the Sabbath day, too. I mean, you say, well, God, I worship you every day, but I don't keep the Sabbath. I don't don't honor you. I'm not, you know, you said to have a holy convocation on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, to honor you. I don't do that, but I worship you every other day, and I, I worship you a little bit on the Sabbath in my own way. Well, that's like building your own cart to build, carry the presence of God on. God is not going to be carried on that. God's not going to follow you. You've got to follow him. You know? As I've said before, it's G-O-D. 
not D-O-G, a little dog that follows you. It's you follow God, amen? So he says, for then there will be a great tribulation, which has not occurred since the beginning of the world till now. And until those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And we know immediately after that, then God is going, Jesus is going to come back. And he says here, for false Christ, verse 24, and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders. So it should, we should know that ahead of time. Why? So as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. That's us. Behold, I have told you in advance. Jesus, uh, that's always scary when Jesus says that. Behold, I've already told you in advance now. You know this already. So when you see all these miracles, seemingly miracles happening, uh, you know, if, if they are not following God's word, if they are not following the apostolic faith, don't listen to them. Now let's go back to chapter 7 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. Again, speaking of false teachers, verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So they don't come, you know, saying, hello, I'm, I'm your new wolf. I've just come in to devour all of you guys, bring heresy in here. No, they don't do that. And they probably don't even know they're a wolf. I mean, I think most wolves, uh, you know, they just, they just act by their own nature. They don't think about, you know, I'm a wolf. I need to go kill some sheep. I don't think they think like that. They're just, in, they, they're driven by instinct. And you see that in Jude's letter, that these men, these false that introduce damnable heresies, they're driven by instinct. And that's what sheep, sheep, sheep are not trying to be mean to the sheep. They're just instinctively kill sheep. That's what they do. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, and, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Rapes are not gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you will know them by their fruits. So he's telling us to look at the fruits. Do they have the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Do they have the truth? Are they following the apostolic faith? Now notice verse 21. Jesus said, now I want you to know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he will enter. Who's going to enter? The one who does the will of God the Father. Many will say to me on that day, speaking of the judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? That's the same thing as saying, didn't we carry your presence? The Lord should say, yeah, on a new cart. Yeah, you, you, uh, you carry my presence, you, you know, you, but, you, no, but you didn't follow me. You didn't do what I said to do. You didn't follow me. You did what you wanted to do in the name of me, in my name. That's what, says, but these people are going to say, look, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name and we perform many miracles. We healed people in your name. We did all these things in your name. We were busy. We were doing your work. We preached the gospel in your name. And then notice what Jesus says he's going to say. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Who's he saying depart from me to? He says, you who practice lawlessness. Now that's frightening. That means you who don't even obey me. You practice lawlessness. What is lawlessness to God? It's just not keeping his law. It's not keeping his commandments. Now let's go over to 
Uh, Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul, there's a problem with the Galatian church. And what's happening in the churches in Galatia is that certain Judaizing Christians had come. Those who believed that Christianity was just a, an appendage of Judaism and that the Gentile converts needed to be circumcised and directed to keep the whole law of Moses. Now, we know this very clearly if we read Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem, because it actually says that there, that there were certain Pharisees who had believed, Paul calls them false brethren here in chapter 2, but in Acts 15, they were considered believers, but who rose up and said, listen, the Gentiles have to be circumcised and directed to keep the whole law of Moses, or they cannot be saved. Now, that's what they were saying. Peter and Barnabas and also uh, Paul stood up to give defense to the Gentiles. And Peter said, listen, they were circumcised when uh, God accepted them. They weren't keeping the whole law of Moses either when God accepted them. So there's a definite difference between the whole law of Moses, which contains laws that were added because of transgressions, and the Ten Commandments and the food laws and the, uh, the holy days. So now notice here, He calls it a false gospel. You, they were practicing legalism. That's what they were doing. Going back to the whole law. Having a messianic. You know, uh, we are not messianic. I know some people think that we are because we keep the holy days. And uh, I mean, I say we're not messianic. I mean, we may be messianic because we believe in the Messiah. Uh, But I'm saying it's commonly called Messianic churches are those who believe in the Hebrew roots, the Hebrew roots movement. And so they, 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 uh, they try to be Jewish in, in the things they do. You see, we're not that at all. Even though we keep the Sabbath, we keep the holy days, we strive to keep the commandments, the food laws. But we do not go back to the whole law of Moses. We understand that that is a different covenant that we are of the covenant of Abraham, not the one that was given at Sinai, that had laws that were added because of transgressions. And just read chapter 3, Paul explains that clearly here in Galatians, but we don't have time. Any of you want to know about this, just go to our website, pointsofthetruth.com, go to the booklet uh, section, and click on the two covenants. And it will explain the difference between the Sinai covenants and all of its laws, including the laws added because of transgressions and the laws that the Christian church kept, which were the same laws that Abraham kept. We find in Genesis chapter 26 that Abraham kept God's laws, commandments, and statutes. But he did not have you know, several hundred laws that were added because of transgressions. Amen. And that would constitute a different gospel, according to Paul, here in in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul said, I am amazed that you were so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really another, only there are some who are disturbing you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what you have preached, He is to be a curse. So those are very, very strong words. Now in chapter 2, notice verse 1. He's talking about going up to Jerusalem. And he said, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking along Titus. And it was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I may be running in vain or in vain, had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But notice verse 4, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us 
into bondage. And then he says, but we did not yield to subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. We find in 2 Peter chapter 2, I won't read it, but Peter said, just as there were false prophets among the people in Israel, there'll be false prophets among you that will come in and introduce just uh, terrible uh, teachings to lead people astray. So what are the characteristics, again, of false Christians? Well, if they're a nominal Christian, a Christian in name only, they may just be worldly. You may not be able to tell much, you know, they say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and, uh, you know, but they don't, look, people will say things like, it's about having a relationship with God, or a relationship with Jesus. It's really more than that. It's about, because we all have a relationship with God. It may be adversarial, it may be a rebellious relationship, but we have a relationship. We may have a relationship where we ignore God. But the truth is, what we find in 1 John, that God has called us to fellowship. And that's a, that's a, that's a completely, we don't, you know, we don't, we, this is a fellowship of Christians. It's not a relationship of Christians. <laughs> it, it's a fellowship of Christians. You know, we used to be called Church of God Fellowship before we were the Crusade Church. Fellowship is different than a relationship. A relationship can be good or bad. It can be indifferent. It can be uh, hot, cold, in between. It can be lukewarm. But fellowship is when you walk together. God has called us to have fellowship. You know, the Bible says, what Paul said, what fellowship has light with darkness? You know, it has no fellowship whatsoever because if the light comes, it overpowers the darkness. So it has no fellowship. You can't have both. So there are uh, uh, some of the characteristics. It's just worldly. Others, was like what was happening here in Galatia. They were legalistic. They weren't relying on the grace of God. We are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2. And not of works so that anyone should boast. But then he goes on to say that we were saved to walk in works prepared beforehand. So our salvation and our righteousness comes from Christ alone. We can't produce it. We cannot produce it. And even though we strive, we want to obey God, we strive to obey Him, we still know we fall short. Amen? And we do. Every day. I mean, you know my story. I used to keep a, uh, you know, a, a planner every day at work, but on the bottom right side, I, I graded myself on Christian attributes, included, including humility. And I've said before, when I got a high score in humility, I was really proud of myself that day. You see, it catches you. you I mean, it's just, then you're no longer humble. You blow it. I was humble all day, and then I was proud about it at the end of the day, and there you go, you see. So, um, but it's like C.S. Lewis said, you know, if you, if, if you want to know how bad you really are, just try to be good. <laughs> That's right. If you try, when you try, then you realize how far you fall short. But we don't have to despair, because it doesn't depend upon us. Oh, it depends upon our attitude, but it depends upon Jesus. We have been given his life and his righteousness. And so he kept the law perfectly. He kept all the commandments perfectly. We still take up our cross, but he did it perfectly. We still keep the commandments, but not perfectly, but he did it perfectly. And we received his righteousness. Amen. Now, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments over and over. So we want to. So there are Christians who are legalistic. I put the Hebrew roots uh, a movement in there because uh, I think that they're legalistic in nature. Uh, that's basically thinking that you're going to uh, earn your salvation through works. Then there's others who are lawless. That's very common among many of the Protestant churches. They won't teach it. If you asked almost all of them, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? Do you teach the Ten Commandments? Almost all of them will say yes, but when you say, well, what about the fourth commandment? And then they'll make excuses for not keeping that one, you see. 
Well, if it's a commandment, it's a commandment. Why don't you make excuses for not keeping some of the elements then? You see what I'm saying? Uh, but it's just that they, people are raised up in a world where it's common. Just, the whole society is set up for Sunday. Uh, all kinds of activities, college football games, everything else, uh, all kinds of things. I mean, a big night out, Saturday, uh, Friday night, and Saturday. So, you know, the devil knew what he was doing when he did those things. And then, of course, the idolatrous uh, false Christianity uh, based upon idolatry. I would say some of those today are those uh, name it and claim it, prosperity preachers, uh, where people are really uh, pursuing wealth and they're trying to use God as a formula to get what they want. So now, the characteristics of a true and faithful Christian. One, a true Christian is led by the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth. You know, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Two, a true Christian puts their faith for salvation and, their, and righteousness in Christ. They understand that only in Christ are we saved, and only in Christ are we righteous in the sight of God. Three, true Christians worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Think about it. You can't really worship God in a lie. David tried. He wasn't thinking. He was lying. But he was not carrying the presence of God according to the will of God. And the will of God is truth. Jesus himself said, I am the truth. You cannot worship Jesus outside of who he is, the truth. Amen? Number four, true Christians are identified in scriptures as those who keep the commandments of God. As I said, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, for one, Paul said, what matters is keeping the commandments of God. And number five, true Christians have a godly love for their fellow brethren. You know, Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples for your love for one another. Now, let's go over to uh, Romans. Uh, well, let's go over to John chapter 4. Romans chapter 8, though, we won't go there, but that tells us that it's those who are led by the Holy Spirit who are the children of God. Now, here in John chapter 4, we find something very interesting. Beginning in verse 19, Jesus goes to Samaria. It's in the northern part of the kingdom of Israel. Uh, and uh, a whole separate nation, actually, the, the, uh, the northern kingdom, the house of Israel. Samaria is the capital city. It's in the land of Ephraim which was one of the two sons of Joseph, the son of Jacob. And so he's there. Now, they, uh, you know, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans because most of the Samaritans were not actually descendants of Abraham. They had been carried away as slaves by the Assyrians in uh, 721 B.C. And the Assyrians put other people a Babylonian stock in the cities and on the farms in order to, to work the land and to pay tribute to them. So the Samaritans would claim to be, uh, you know, a brother to the Jews when things were going good, but when things weren't going good with the Jews, they said, oh, no, we're not related. We were put here a long time ago by the Assyrians, you see. So there was, they didn't love each other. Let's just put it that way. But Jesus goes there, and, and he, he meets this woman at the well, and he asks for a drink, and that's how it starts. So verse 19, the woman said to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And she said, Our fathers, which was not true because her fathers were not the descendants of Abraham, but our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say, I mean you Jews, say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Now notice what Jesus said. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship 
you worship what you do not know. And that's common. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father. How? In spirit and in truth. So true worshipers worship the Father. How? In spirit and in truth. You know, it's not like there's a holy place. You yourself are a temple. God dwells in you. The church itself is a dwelling place, a holy temple of God, a spiritual house. We find in 1 Peter chapter 2. So notice, but an hour is coming and now is. So it's not future. He's saying even at that time. And now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So you have to worship spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. For God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, you have to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And you and that is the spirit of truth. And you worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, now let's go over to John chapter 14. We're in the book of John. Chapter 14. And this is the last Passover before Jesus went out to the garden where he was resurrected. And so John gives us details, a detailed account of what was said during the last Passover. It's the only... uh, account we have in any of the Gospels of, of such a, a comprehensive uh, account of what was said. But Jesus told his disciples on the very last Passover that he met with them. Notice verse 15. He said to them, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now that's very simple, isn't it? He, this is his last night before his crucifixion. And he's telling them very important things. If you love me, you're going to know it by keeping my commandments. So a true Christian loves God and he shows his love for God by keeping the commandments. Now that's not the only way he can show his love to God, but you can't show your love to God and not keep the commandments. Amen? Fail to keep them. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Now, do we have the authority, really, to pick and choose which commandments are important? Well, we really don't. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, whoever relaxes and teaches even the least of the commandments shall be ranked least in the kingdom. So even if you think something is least, maybe you think the fourth commandment is least. It may in your mind be least, but it's not non-existent. It's not nothing. It's not small. It's still a commandment written by God's finger into tablets of stone, just like all the other commandments. In verse 23, he said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. So he says, look, you will know me, and you will know the Father if you obey, if you keep my word, if you keep my commandments. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father." Who sent me? These things I've spoken to you while abiding with you. In chapter 15, notice verse 5. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. So they were once on him, but they were removed. Why? Because they were not bearing fruit. And if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done. 
My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. God is all about fruit, always has been. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. And then he tells us how. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Now, what, you know, can you say, well, I can abide in God's love, but I'm not going to keep his commandments. This is what he says. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments. He kept them and abided his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. I know I've heard people, I've actually heard preachers say uh, that Jesus broke a commandment or he broke this commandment. Uh, But at the end of it all, Jesus said, I have kept my father's commandment. He says that in chapter 17. At the end of it, he says, I have kept your commandments. I've kept all the commandments. So he kept the commandments. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Notice verse 15. John says, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. In other words, if you're enticed by the world, that's not, that's not from the Father. The world is passing away, and also it's lust. Now, if you gaze at the world, you're going to lust after the world. You have to keep your eyes on Jesus. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. You know, uh, we don't teach against drinking. We teach against drunkenness because that's what the Bible says. But if a person has a problem, if a person had a history of being an alcoholic and they had to stay away from that because of uh, former addiction or something like that, that's very wise, of course. (laughs) You don't hang out where there's alcohol being served all the time. You don't put yourself in that place. Amen. If you have a problem with it, you know. So you don't put your eyes where they don't belong, you know. Uh, You you do those things, of course, you're going to have trouble. Now notice verse 19. Well, first, you know, let's read that again. Do not love the world nor the things of the world, verse 15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you love this world, the love of God is not in you. That's what he says. I'm grieved by this world. I am grieved. I tell you, it's hard. Sometimes I wish I didn't keep up with as much news as I did. I can't believe the wickedness. Did you see that family in Southern California that had 13 children and had them all in shackles? One of them was 29 years old. They were malnourished. But the pets were well fed. It's, it's shocking. And they had family photos where they're all smiling. And they're prisoners. They didn't know anything. Hardly knew anything. They were, they were just kept from everything. Horribly abused. Shackled with chains. One of them happened to get loose. And you look, it's a nice neighborhood. It's a nice house in a nice neighborhood, houses right next to one another. How do they not know? Look at the wickedness. Uh, I mean, people around there had no idea. It's shocking. They have 13 of their own children, and they've kept them in chains their whole life. Shackled. Uh, malnourished. The oldest one being 29 years old. The father was 57. Looking at him, you would never notice. It's wicked. 
Do not love the world, verse 15, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You hear it? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the prideful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away, and also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Isn't that what you want? You want to perish along with the world? In verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. Or they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they were, that they all are not of us. Some people want the world. Some people love the world. Some people go to the world, but then they come to their senses and come back. And I thank God for that. Chapter five, verse two. By this, we know we love the children of God. We love each other. When we love God and observe his commandments. So that, listen, the last five commandments is about loving your, each other. The first four is about loving God. The fifth one is about how to honor and obey your parents. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. You can't say you have the love of God and don't keep his commandments. For whatever is born of, of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Second John, verse 6. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and antichrist. So he's telling us, look, there's the deceivers in the world. So you need to remember to keep God's commandments. Now, 1 John chapter 2, back over to 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. This is a very pointed statement, but it's in the Bible. By this we know we have come to know him. There's a lot of people say they know God. But John says, to the church, and this is to us today, it's to anybody that, that claims to be in, in the church of God, because that's who the letter went out to, all the churches. And there's people sitting in those churches, just like we see people sitting in churches, you know, today. And John says, by this we know that we have come to know him. John's speaking of himself too. If we keep his commandments. And see, he's connecting, keeping the commandments with even knowing God. And J Jesus did that, remember? In chapter four, 14 of John, he said, if you keep my commandments, we will abide with you. Your father, you will be, uh, he will reveal himself to you. You will know him. The one who says, I've come to know him, and does not keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him. It doesn't mean he's trying to lie, but that's what this word says. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. This is the way. Well, what way? That we keep his commandments. Now, we don't make a God out of the commandments. We don't say that's what we need to just focus on. We're not saying that. But we're saying if you are Christ-centered, you're going to obey God. Amen? You will not. You, what God says, his commandments will be weighty. They'll mean something to you. But the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. How did he walk? Well, he said, I've kept all my Father's commandments. Now, in Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to paraphrase this. We can go over to, uh, we're going to conclude in Matthew chapter 5, but I am going to just paraphrase uh, Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 14. In chapter 12, we see the story of the dragon being cast down. I think this is the second time. I think this is the end time. I think Satan is going to go up and try to take over uh, one more time. But at any rate, I don't know. But when he is cast down, and we know this is the last days, and that's what Revelation is talking about, chapter 12. It says that the dragon came down when he saw that he was cast down to the earth. 
uh, with his angels. He drew a third of the stars of heaven with him. That's his demons. That he was wroth, he was angry, and he went after the woman. Now, in this case, the woman is not Israel. And we know the woman is not Israel, even though many will argue that the woman is Israel in this case. The woman is not Israel because the woman is identified as those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Now, the Jews believe in keeping the commandments of God, Israel does, but they do not receive the testimony of Jesus. They don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. So it cannot be Israel. It has to be uh, an assembly of people who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Now, it says that the devil went after the woman, and the woman went into her place in the wilderness, and I think this is probably going to be a literal place, just like uh, the Pharaoh coming down on Israel at the Red Sea, and God opening up the Red Sea, swallowing up his army. In this case, the, the devil will send a flood. Maybe that's an army. Maybe it's water. I don't know. After the woman to wash her away or to attack her or to destroy her or whatever, and the earth will open up the woman. So instead of the sea, it will be the earth at this time, and the earth will swallow up the flood, whether it be an army or whether it be water. And he's angry because he can't get to the woman. The woman is in her place of safety in the wilderness to be protected for a time, times, and half a time. That's the tribulation, three and a half years. So now it says something very interesting. It ends that chapter with, and he was wroth with the woman, but he couldn't get to the woman. So he turns to go after the remnant of her seed. In other words, those who were not worthy of being protected during the tribulation. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, speaking of that day, of uh, the, it's all of that prophecy like we read in chapter 24 of Matthew. He said, pray that, that you would be accounted worthy to escape these things. So there are, will be some people who will be accounted worthy to escape these things. Not a rapture to heaven, but to a place in the wilderness that God himself will take them. But the rest, the devil is going to go after. The remnant of her seed, those who are left over, who are not protected, and he, they're identified as those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Now, in chapter 14, we find the difference between those who uh, receive the mark of the beast and what's going to happen to them, that they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. They're going to be tortured day and night. And the smoke of their torment is going to go up. And then it said, by contrast, but this is a perseverance of the saints of God who keep the commandments of God and hold their faith in Jesus. So we see at the very end of the tribulation that Matthew chapter 24, the Sabbath is going to be still a holy day. Pray that your flight wouldn't have on it. And we find that the, the, that the uh, saints in the end time are identified as those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. So now we're going to conclude here, Matthew chapter 5. And we'll have Donnie come up and close us in prayer after this. We'll begin in verse 16. Now Jesus, this is uh, uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount called the Beatitudes. <laughs> Jesus said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So he's saying, let your light shine. Now, this is the continuum. We're continuing on. So everything that he says is a way to let your light shine. Amen? I mean, when he says, uh, you know, when you're presenting an offering to the altar... And you, you, know, you, you find that you have uh, something against a brother, leave that offering and go to them. That's letting your light shine. You see, when he says, don't make any vows, that's letting your light shine. When he says, let your statement be yes and yes and not anything beyond that, that's letting your light shine. When you don't extract an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that's letting your light shine, okay? So everything that he says after this verse is in context with letting your light shine. 
But immediately after this, we find that letting our light shine is teaching the commandments of God and keeping them. Because he said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Now, that means that the commandments are not fulfilled. Now, did Jesus fulfill the Passover? Yeah. You know, were some things fulfilled? Of course they were. Uh, you know, the fact that he gave his life, he fulfilled that. He was resurrected. He fulfilled that scripture. But in this context, it's talking about the commandments of the law, right? And he says, those will remain until heaven and earth pass away. Now, there's, heaven and earth is still here. But heaven and earth will pass away someday. We'll have a new heaven and a new earth. So now notice verse 19. And this is a part of letting your light shine. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, that person shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So not only do we find that as Christians are identified in these last days as keeping the commandments of God and having their faith in Jesus, we find that Those who are going to be great in the kingdom of God are those who keep and teach the commandments of God. Not keep them for salvation, not keep them for righteousness, but keep them because they want to be obedient children. Amen? They want to be obedient to the Lord. They don't want to be numbered with the sons of disobedience where the wrath of God rests upon them. Now as Christians, as I close here... Donnie will come up, close us in prayer, and ask the blessing on the meal. But there's a lot of things that identify Christians. We follow the Holy Spirit. We bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Kindness, humble, gentle, forgiving. We're obedient. We're submissive. We honor authority. Uh, you know, patient when wrong. We don't take into account a wrong suffered. There's a lot of things that where we grow greatly in the sanctifying work that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God does in us as, you know, as we continue on. And I I don't know, but I I know with, probably with most of you, um, you know, as longer I've been in the faith, um, the smaller I see myself, the more I know uh, how weak I am and how great and how strong God is. And so I'm thankful. So, I, you know, if we're growing in humility, see, when you can grow in the knowledge and grace and truth of God, when you can grow in obedience to the Lord, faithfulness to the Lord, and it, it has a, a humbling effect upon you, then you know that 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 is the sanctifying work of the Spirit and the Word of God in you, and that that is learning to be more faithful as time goes on more and more. Amen. And we put more of our confidence in the Lord rather than ourselves. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, for these words, your teachings, your words, and just pray, Lord, that you'll help us all to grow and be able to worship you in spirit and truth more and more. And we just pray for your blessing on this meal, blessing on our the fellowship and the Bible study, and the rest of the rest of the things that go on. For the rest of the day, Lord, we just give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.